What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I am your host, Pablo. And joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, what's going on? How you doing, man? Not much. Uh, got a little bit of a jerry-rigged setup here from the road this week, but uh, we got so much news and so many things we want to talk about. Didn't want to didn't want to waste the opportunity. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason probably why you clicked on this show is because we're talking about something most people would uh, frown upon on the idea of this genre going away. It may not ever go away, but it may not be as proliferant as it is now. Um, And this is just an idea, but I've been flirting with this idea for quite some time. And Brian, um, I wanna ask you about the possibility of the end of the MCU or the beginning of, what would that look like? What would have to be the, I guess, uh, starting point or, or, or trend in order for people to really, because the word fatigue gets thrown around a lot. I don't feel it that much, but the more we get subpar films, the more um, disinterested I become. Um, so, so in your thoughts, what do you think has to be, has to start in order for the MCU to start um, go, heading down the wrong path of, uh, you know, people not wanting to see uh, superhero films? Well, first off, this is, ha- I mean, through sin- the history of movies, it, 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 it's 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 like the career of any all-time athlete. Like Father Time is undefeated. Yeah. There, there 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 isn't anything that has lasted forever. If you if you look through the history of movies, there's a period where how many war movies were getting made? In part because America had gone to war for so many yeah. times. But in the moment, as those movies were coming out, you probably would there probably would have been a time where you said. War movies are the peak genre. They're never going to go away. They're always going to be one of the dominant forms of cinema. And then they, not that they don't ever make a war movie, but they're few and far between these days, right? Yeah. The Western, another example, right? How many Westerns did John Wayne make? How many Westerns, you know, did Clint Eastwood make? Like, there was a period in the 60s and 70s where Westerns became as prolific as any piece of, of movie making that was out there. These days, the most Western you get is probably the Yellowstone universe, which is on TV and on Paramount Plus. Yeah. So, you know, I think, yeah, as big a fan of Marvel as we could have been or as anyone could have been, you had to know that all good things come to an end. There is no forever uh, when it comes to something. But yeah. I do think... The moment we find ourselves in now, I think you're asking a relevant question, which is Marvel has had more missteps, and we'll get into it in the past. I would say po- since the pandemic onset and they started releasing content, they had more missteps than they had in the prior you know, decade plus. And that's where the question is coming from. Like, where, what's driving those missteps? Are they symptomatic of a bigger problem? And if they can't get it corrected, are we, yes, will we look back at 2020, 2021 and say that was where Marvel lost its mojo and the end of the MCU as the dominant driver of box office began? Um, if you, I think you texted me. I don't know if you, if we spoke about it on the last pod, but uh, you stated this era of MCU films after um, Far From Home have been hit or miss. Um, Eternals was something that I expected to be fantastic. I, you know, I still like the movie, but um, the execution of that film just didn't didn't 
sit right, right? Um, for, for a lot of people. Um, but visually and, so, and some of the aspects of that film were certainly very intriguing, although they didn't dive into certain other things that we perhaps wanted to get an indication of, which, by the way, Multivolts and Madness sort of failed to do so as well. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, so... What else? Well, um, you and I have discussed in our last pod again, Doctor Strange 2 wasn't something um, that I'll say it like this for a concept as the multiverse, the way this movie has been hyped, the, all the rumors about cameos. The unexpected of this film, where they had the possibility of doing so many things and they didn't. Or they did and didn't show it to us. Or the idea was floating out there and they didn't they didn't go with that. It was very underwhelming. Right? Forget about the performances and I like. Scarlett Johansson. Oh, yeah, that's all that's beautiful. To me, it's like Michael Jordan, you know, playing for the Wizards and he's scoring 80 points and they still lose and have, you know, so it doesn't matter. Great performance, but at the end of the day, they didn't get it. They didn't accomplish something I thought that they would have. And that's possibly get close to the success that No Way Home was. This movie could have been well, that. Well, they said that. They're the ones who said that's what they were gunning for, a no way home level of event with the movie. We didn't say that. They said that. But, no, but, we, we, but Brian, we said this before the movie, before they said that. We said that, I, especially I did, I thought there was a possibility of Doctor Strange 2 doing some huge numbers. We, we flirted with the idea of that. But they came out and said that's what they were expecting. Brian. You want to give us uh, an update on the box office numbers? <laughs> so Dr. Strange 2 in weekend number two, the box office dropped nearly 70%. I predicted it would be 70% or more. It came in slightly better than that, but it was pretty much as bad a second weekend drop as Marvel has had for its films, which means there is a chance and a growing chance that Doc Strange 2 is not going to make a billion dollars, which I think we would have said was a layup prior to the release of this film. Now, in fairness to Doc Strange 2, all of these movies that are getting blocked in China, you kind of have to at least say, look, the movies that were released in China leading up to Endgame were making a couple hundred million dollars there. So if you don't get a release there, we do have to asterisk and say it's not a fair comparison. You're just wiping out, you know, 100, 200 um, million a box office before you even start. That being said, when you open at 450, your expectation is you can still make a billion dollars. And the reason you don't is because the word of mouth is bad or not great, which causes the movie to fall off a lot. The other reason is competition. And this is not a Top Gun podcast. The reviews that Top Gun Maverick is getting, as well reviewed a blockbuster movie as has ever been released, literally, I'm not understating that. Mm. That is coming in less than two weeks and will wipe out Doctor Strange from the box office. So you're looking at a movie that, again, is going to make money, but it's kind of going to be, and people may think this is blasphemous. This is a lot more Batman versus Superman than it is <laughs> Avengers. And I'm serious because Batman versus Superman was 166 million domestic. It was a huge opening weekend, but the word of mouth wasn't good. And it wound up making 800 million and change. And it was viewed as a setback to the franchise. Now, I don't know if Doc Strange 2 is going to be viewed as a huge setback to the franchise, but it's going to end up probably in a similar level of box office, which you have to view as a disappointment relative to what the expectations were. Are we expecting too much from each film, Brian? You know, do we think 
oh, this movie's going to make a billion. This movie's going to make a billion. I mean, they were doing a billion on each movie for a minute, weren't they? Well, yeah, we talked about it like Captain Marvel's not a billion dollar movie, but they were made a billion dollars off it because of the momentum train they had leading into Endgame. Yeah. But l- let me throw a couple other numbers at you. We like, we like to deal in numbers, not just opinions here. So I have maintained that Marvel gets graded on a curve on Rotten Tomatoes by critics because of the goodwill they've built up. But I thought it was interesting to go to the cinema score, which is the audience view of the films. So I think this is a good step. The so Marvel's had 28 movies. Okay. Doctor Strange 2 received a B cinema score that was tied for the lowest ever handed to a Marvel movie with Eternals. You have two. So in the last year, you've had two of the lowest cinema score ratings Marvel has ever received in its 28 films. Here's my trivia question. Of the previous 26 movies, how many received a cinema score below A minus? One. Wow. So they went, tw- one, so basically up until Endgame, and even mm-hmm. if you want to include Black Widow and Shang-Chi, only one time did the audience walk out of the theater and say, this is less than an A plus A or A minus experience. And now it's happened two of the last three movies. And the movie it did not happen for, you can't give them, you cannot give them full credit for No Way Home, which was an A plus. You can't. As much as we know that Marvel was heavily involved in the storytelling of that trilogy, if you give them full credit for No Way Home, you then have to attach Morbius that you have to put that as those are also Marvel characters that Sony's putting out there. So you got to choose. You, you you can give them half credit, I think, but you can't give them full credit for No Way Home because Sony's still releasing that. I, I, I would say, Brian, to that, I have to give Marvel full credit. And the reason why, because Sony gave us Morbius. I don't think Marvel had any thing to do with Mor- uh, Morbius. I don't think so. Do you believe that? That may be. Okay. That that may be. I'm just pointing out, though, if you're going to give Sony zero for a movie that they had the rights to the characters involved in, I don't think that's dealing 100% fair. So I'm saying as good a movie as No Way Home is, if if we want to give them 75%, that's fine. But I think to give Marvel 100% credit for that, I think is disrespectful to Sony owning the rights to those characters. And ultimately, like, can you prove that it was Marvel that high, you know, that brought back Garfield and brought back McGuire? And I don't think you can prove where the line is. The contracts were probably signed by Amy Pascal, not by yeah. Kevin Feige. So I just, I'm just saying that like, there's a little bit of shared flowers that goes all around for that movie. Um, and so that's why I kind of have a little asterisk on there. And I'm just pointing out that the last two movies where Marvel was solo are tied for the two of the worst received movies from an audience perspective that have been put out there. And they were both box office disappointments in Eternals and Doc Strange 2. So we're getting a string of films that, and, and, and I think you're right, there, there are people out there that's just going to like anything. I'm sorry. There's people that are just going to like these movies because they see, they, they, you know, they, they, we're in a place where we're seeing characters from the comics on screen and it's wonderful. Yes, I agree. But we're getting to a point where these movies aren't giving us that, uh, I guess that exhilaration that we were feeling with Endgame, No Way Home. Infinity War. Not to say that every Marvel movie has to be big, but you're presenting them as big, right? The way you're going is big. This wasn't big. This is a localized situation, right? It wasn't aiming to end the multiverse. It wasn't ending to do any of that. It was 
stopping Scarlet Witch from doing this. That's it. And the multiverse has presented, you know, I was watching the other day, uh, Neil Tyson Degrassi. That's his name. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was explaining the multiverse. And man, fascinating, <laughs> but confusing as hell. I think Marvel's in a situation where it's fascinating, the possibilities, the stories that they can tell, but it can it, it might get confusing and 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 too complex. I want to give you a couple other numbers here, just for just for reference. I made a point on our Doc Strange podcast, which I first listened, you might have been sort of shocked at. I said, I don't think Marvel and DC are that far apart right now in terms of. Yes, so many. But it's not. But it's not because DC has necessarily ascended or made a quantum leap. It's more because Marvel is falling back. So let me let me just give you a straight side by side. And again, No Way Home was a little problematic in this, but well, I can, I'll bring it back in at the end. You have Black Widow again, post Endgame, post pandemic. Black Widow, eighty percent Rotten Tomatoes score. A minus cinema score. Shang Chi, ninety-two percent Rotten Tomatoes. A cinema score. Eternals, forty-seven percent Rotten Tomatoes. B cinema score. Doc Strange two, seventy-four percent Rotten Tomatoes. B cinema score. Those are the four Marvel Studios only movies. Now, obviously, No Way Home is ninety-four percent Rotten Tomatoes. A plus, so it's awesome. But let's put that to the side because DC during the same time period has only put out four movies itself. Wonder yeah. Woman 1984, 58% Rotten Tomatoes, seven, uh, 70. Now, they did not have a cinema score because it didn't go to the movies, but 73% audience score is a comp. Zack Snyder's Justice League also didn't go to the movies, obviously, but 71% Rotten Tomatoes, 94% audience score. Suicide Squad, 90% Rotten Tomatoes, B plus cinema score. And The Batman, 85% Rotten Tomatoes, A minus cinema score. So my point is, if you take No Way Home to the side in the studio experience and just put four against four, I think it's at least a conversation. Yeah. As to where I said, you can only have one set of movies. You can have Wonder Woman 84, Zack Snyder's Justice League, Suicide Squad, and The Batman, or you can have Eternals, Doc Strange 2, Shang-Chi, and Black Widow. That, to me, is actually a viable conversation. And I don't think you could ever have had that conversation before. I really don't. And so yeah. I, I, I stand by what I said. I think you could definitely convince me that because I have to have the Batman and I can't not have the Batman. And I actually think Zack Snyder's Justice League is pretty good. And there's a lot of people who think James Gunn's Suicide Squad is good, even though I didn't necessarily love it. And then, all right, I have to take Wonder Woman 84. But like on the Marvel side, I have to take Eternals. Like I, it is a lot closer than people want to admit, I yeah, think, yeah. right this yeah. second. In the meantime, we still got Thor the Love and Thunder coming out, which we're really excited for, right, Brian? We got Black Panther. Everybody's gonna be that movie is gonna be huge. Go ahead. So I think when we step back and have this conversation, I started to think about like what made the MCU work to begin with. And then I said, okay, what's actually changed? Is there any clue there as to what's going on? So a couple of really obvious ones. I don't think Marvel has lost its touch when it comes to casting for the most part. So if you go back to the very beginning, Robert Downey Jr., right? An inspired choice as Iron Man when his career was not what it is today. Chris Evans as, you know, Steve Rogers, I think he had wound up being better in that role than anyone could have imagined. Certainly yeah. Chris Hemsworth. I mean, they basically discovered Chris Hemsworth and he yeah. turned out to be maybe the best actor. You could argue he's the best actor of all of them today. Yeah. Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, an unassailable choice. You know, Jeremy Renner's Hawkeye's fine. Hawkeye really wasn't given all that much to do, in fairness. Renner was probably overqualified. But hey, yeah. if you're going to have somebody in that kind of role, might as well be a two-time Oscar nominee. Mark Ruffalo in the Hulk 
started out well. I think we can debate where he went. I think we probably all, you know, if we didn't have the baggage, would have preferred Ed Norton because he he seemed like he did a pretty, he did a very good job. I thought an incredible Hulk, but we know the side story there. So, and that then led into you know, even a choice like Josh Brolin to to voice and inhabit Thanos as being a great choice. Chadwick Boseman, great choice. Uh, may he rest in peace. Paul Rudd, perfect for Ant Man. So. Anthony Mackie as Falcon. I mean, they, you can just go on down the list. Um, yeah. Haley Atwell. They, 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 they Chris really, Pratt, yeah. Elizabeth Olsen, as we just saw. Chris Pratt, great call. Great call. Part, you know, go from TV into that starring role. So I look at what we've gotten more recently. I don't see a massive drop off. Like Florence Pugh, that's a grand slam choice in casting. Um, I, you know, even, the, you know, I think Simu Liu did quite well i think he kind of got a tough draw because he was up against tony leung in that movie and then nobody's going to really win that head to head but you could also argue hey casting tony leung as the as the villain of that movie was also inspired casting yeah um you know i would i would then say even lesser characters like katherine hahn you know in the tv shows you know sofia de martino in the loki show jonathan majors the bit we've seen i'm not seeing that marvel's you know, throwing a whole bunch of wild pitches when it comes to hiring actors. Yeah. That's not where I see massive fall. Yeah. But when I look at the directors and kind of what's going on there, that's where I see things getting a little more interesting because Marvel's reputation was formed with, they didn't go for the biggest director. Like John Favreau was not, Steven Spielberg when he got hired. You know, Joe Johnston was was a Spielberg disciple, was like a period piece type of guy to direct the film. Kenneth Branagh was like, okay, you want something classical, a little more Shakespearean, go direct. And then obviously, like Joss Whedon had mostly done TV. The Russo brothers, we think of them as these blockbuster films. They, they did TV prior yeah. to doing this. But now we're getting Sam Raimi, Chloe Zhao, you know, we're getting some filmmakers who cut their teeth doing movies first. Now, it worked to start. Ryan Coogler, it worked. Came up with small movies, made the leap, did an awesome job. Everything he's made and touched so far has been awesome. But you're kind of seeing like Marvel's getting access maybe to a different type of director than they did before, now that they're a bigger deal. And they've come under fire for not letting directors have enough say. Remember Edgar Wright with Ant-Man, Patty Jenkins with Thor 2, right? They, they came under criticism, right? Scott Derrickson. So now you're like, you can sort of see Marvel being like, we got bigger name directors. We're giving them a little bit more of the control. And now we're seeing the results be maybe not what we want. So I put the question back to you. Did we underrate the MCU formula all along? Because as they're giving more control, they're becoming a little bit more like DC and they're getting a little more hit or miss in products as a result. And they're losing a bit of that crowd pleasing consistency that yeah. they had when the studio and Kevin Feige seemed to have a bit more control? Yeah. Um, I've always said, Brian, like, with regards to DC and giving directors full control or, or more control and let them, letting them do whatever they want, fine, you're not getting this connectivity that we all enjoy in the MCU. But you're also not getting these characters from the comic books aren't coming to life. I think it takes a particular type of, of director like Matt Reeves, who really wants to do something specific and that really has never been done before with a character that is reminiscent of the comics. I've, I've always said that if you work for Marvel, I think you should be Marvel should continue to do what they've been doing, what's been working. 
but I don't know if Brian is that, although it seems to be a trail, you know, that you can sort of point that and be like, this could be an issue here. I also think the complexity of the multiverse and in, in writing these stories, we've heard the stories of them doing reshoots and all this other stuff. And now they got to, the, their world is crumbling. Now they got to keep it up together. You're, but you're bringing up a good point. I want, I want to, so I, I talked about casting. We talked about directing. You're talking about writing. You're talking about storytelling. And I think you're onto something here. So I, I wanted to ask you this question because with Marvel, and some of this was by necessity, right? Because they didn't have the platform they have now. They weren't even a part of Disney when they when they started. So there was, they were forced into a more linear path because that's all they had. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the progression to Endgame, it is largely a linear progression. It's introduce one character, introduce two, introduce three, put the team together, introduce Thanos. Thanos now has a largely linear path where he has to get all six stones. And then the only time they messed with the linear part was to basically go backwards and then forwards in Endgame, right? Where they put time travel in the idea. So there's a real simplicity to that that I think is easy to create constant momentum. And they use the cut scenes and the credit scenes very effectively. They use the they knew where to place their pieces on the board to mix and match them to keep you headed in that direction. You reference multiverse is not linear. It is the definition of not linear. Yeah. Um, we also know that Marvel is in a, I think, and I continue to think it's the right thing. They're in a phase of experimentation right now. There's no question mm, that some of yeah. what we're seeing is by design, a lab experiment to find out what works and what doesn't. My question to you is this. Did they introduce the multiverse too soon? Because they're doing the multiverse while they're experimenting. Is that potentially at the core of some of the problems? Should they have waited to really go full multiverse until they were into the next real big phase of buildup that they wanted to do? Should they have gone more self-contained? Should they have gone more Moon Knight-esque and been more self-contained for Phase 4 than they have? Um, it's quite possible. I mean, yes, they could have gone and done a fantastic... I, I think they could have started with other characters and not have to be multiverse. The only problem is that you had Loki. Right, perhaps Loki. Which was know, great. <laughs> after after, but after Loki, let's say after Loki, you're gonna do a season two, so we're gonna get more multiverse. So for those uh, those people out there who said that the multiverse is gonna get resolved, it's not gonna last for long. The multiverse is is gonna be here for a minute. But um, what if they had released? What if they waited to release Loki till like 2024? Same exact show but waited until they were going to connect it into something that was more contiguous than what we have now. Because I would argue things that have worked the best, like Moon Knight in some ways was refreshing because it did not have a lot of the multiversal connection. Yeah. And I would say part of the reason I think the audience responded to Shang-Chi as well as they did was Shang-Chi of all the stories they told was probably the most like Iron Man, Captain America, Thor 1 in terms of introducing a new character. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying the introduction of new characters would have been a, a better decision and then slowly introduce the multiverse. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is you could have done Loki series, right? And just let that be something that's there and start hinting at the, the at, you know, doing the, the, the mid credit scenes and the end credit scenes leading towards that, right? I mean, with Thanos, he wasn't in any other movies except to the end. You saw him for like, what, five, 10 seconds? You could have kept doing that and put it, and, and while we put pieces together yeah. and at the same time, introduce new characters. Why not do Fantastic Four? Why not do um, Galactus? You don't have to even come to Earth. You don't have to even introduce the Fantastic Four. You can start at Zen La. 
and have yeah. Galactus come in and make him his herald. I want to see that. I don't want to see Galactus and Silver Surfer already together. I want to see the origin of that. Again, Brian, if you haven't seen the third episode of Silver Surfer, <laughs> and it's like, I'm telling you, you got to watch it, Brian, so that you can see what I'm talking about. But yes, I think if you would have gone that route, although events leading up to a bigger event like Secret Wars, for example, would have lasted quite some time. But my expectation was that these Disney Plus things were there to enable you to tell the story much faster. And so they're not doing that. They're doing what you're saying that they should have done. Introduce new characters, new situations, perhaps nothing to do with the multiverse, except for Loki. Let Loki be its thing. And these things um, happen without the knowledge of this multiverse thing going on, uh, um, going on all over the place, right? That is that. Although that, ironically, I, part of what, I was going to say, part of what elevated Loki was the introduction of an epic new character at the end. Oh, yeah. Right. For sure. So, I mean, like, with that show is a good, that show is a very good show without Kang. It's a great show with Kang. I, although I think Moon Knight missed an opportunity of doing something like with Rama Tut in there. They should have thrown an Easter egg. I don't, think they, I don't think they did throw an Easter egg. I thought we would have probably would have seen um, Apocalypse, nothing. That would have been something dope if they would have put that in there. But they didn't do it. I think, I don't know if Kevin is, in, is as involved or is not really, I think he's perhaps maybe putting a lot of people in charge. Perhaps, perhaps this retreat is like, yo, what's going on? I leave y'all to do whatever and, and this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you for one thing. <laughs> and this, yeah, who knows, Brian? Perhaps that retreat is that, who knows? Well, his, his comment about the Doc Strange 2 trailer, I thought was so out of character. It like, it at least put the, the radar up that like something is not all right inside the inner machine. For him to call out the entire marketing department and th he, just, he just rolled the bus and over them and back. Yeah. And I, I think he's right, but I, I've never heard him. I've never heard him say that about yeah. Yeah. anything else they put out. We'll move on after this, but that trailer was very, very upsetting, Brian. That Doc Strange trailers towards the end where they were showing stuff, those ones were very, very upsetting. Well, let, let, let's talk a little bit about, like I said, all is not lost. In no. the sense that, like I said, I maintain a, a lot of what you're seeing, like I said, is by design we're taking some swings. We're doing things outside the comfort zone very deliberately to see if the audience will respond to it. And if it does not, I do not expect it to be in existence over the next five to 10 years. And so in some ways, I would think, I would say Marvel is right. You don't mess around with the Fantastic Four. You don't mess around with X-Men. You don't, you don't put them in the lab and say, eh, maybe this will play. You bring them in when you have a clear vision and a clear sense of what you want them to do in the broader universe. But I do think Marvel has to understand that like the goodwill you've built up with audiences worldwide is not infinite. And that's what we mean by everything in, in cinema dies eventually. Like you get a certain number of pop-ups and strikeouts and double plays. You don't get an endless number of them. And when it, as it as it pertains to Disney Plus in particular, I am getting a little bit concerned that Marvel may have overreached in terms of the number of shows, the rate of shows they're putting out, and quite honestly, the quality that we're getting is being hampered by how good the movies have been. So people see Marvel Disney Plus show and they think, well, that that's just a six-hour Marvel movie. And we're kind of finding out that's not really the case. Yeah. I mean, do you think the bar for I think the bar for those shows we're finding out is supposed to be lower than the bar for the films? 
because I think by if, if you hold them to the same standard of the Infinity Saga, Disney Plus shows have been on balance a major disappointment. I would say that the Disney Plus shows have been decent show, very and like you said, experimental and 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 they're trying different things. Wanda Vision was a very very prime example of that. Um, the extraordinary performance of, of, of Oscar Isaac and Moon Knight uh, and what they did there. There are some some good shows. Falcon and Winter Soldier wasn't bad. It's just, you know, we they had the problem landing the plane. You know, um, Hawkeye, for me, I love some of the episodes and then they all fell apart. So it's... Uh, and like, listen, we're, we're not experts at this stuff, you know, and I, we understand that you, we don't know how to make a show. We don't know how to make a movie, but we can use some good ideas. <laughs> but, but that, but that's kind of my point is that like, so uh, to, to give you an example, like I just watched um, Slow Horses on Apple TV Plus. Outstanding spy show. I'd recommend it to anyone. But like, I don't watch that show with the best of James Bond or the best of Jason Bourne as the standard going in. I just enjoy the show for what it is. Yeah. And it's a great show. And that's what I mean by like, if you take WandaVision or Loki in isolation and you remove the rest of the MCU, there's some really enjoyable high level television in there. But I think when you say like you're met, those characters are drawn from the movies. And so you're measuring those shows against Endgame and you're measuring them against Winter Soldier. Yeah. Maybe that's, and that's just probably not fair. That's probably not no, fair yeah, to yeah, them. Yeah, but, we're fi- but we're finding out that, you know, they don't look, the action doesn't look quite on par with that. The effects don't look quite on par with that. The storytelling isn't as tight or as consistent over six hours or eight hours as it is over two. Like, it's just not the same. Um, but I am curious, and it is my belief, and I don't know how you feel about this. I think that Marvel is releasing this batch of shows as fast as they can. I do not think we will ultimately have four and five Marvel shows a year on top of three or four films. That strikes me as it, we're finding out that's too many, too many things on the calendar. I would not be surprised if post the retreat, we start moving back to max three films a year, max like two shows a year. I don't know. I, I, I can I can agree with the number of movies uh, being released per year, three, yeah, perhaps even four, who knows, but three to four. Getting two shows a year, though, I don't know. I don't know. I think they can do. I think the issue is with the the the, the a the stories that they're going to tell and how they're all going to connect. Does it have to connect? No. But it has to further along the history, I guess, of the MCU and how they, you know, how, I, I mean, even in in Moonlight, there were connections, right? All these things are going to have connections. Um. Even, you know, uh, um, Captain America, no, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Madripoor, you, everybody knows what that is, you know? Yeah. So you're gonna, you, you'll continue doing this while you're telling these, these stories. Again, I think that in my head, the, 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 the vehicle, the Disney Plus um, um, was the vehicle that they were going to use to tell some storylines, to further along some storylines, so we don't have to wait 10 years for an end game. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know what happens after the retreat, but it'll, I, I can't wait to hear what Kevin Feige has to say next and what rumors um, we'll be getting. Um, but the MCU right now, and again, it's not to say that the MCU is dying or people are, are becoming disinterested in it. 
Although there's some people whom I've spoken to that they're, you know, they're done with MCU. They don't want to, and that's, you know, I'm not there yet, but the disappointments in certain films and the expectations that I have for them, when they don't meet them, I get a little bit discouraged and, and, and wonder, you know, where is this all going? Well, I think I texted you this sports analogy, but, you know, Pat Riley called this the disease of me. And it was, you know, when, when a team wins a championship, all of the individual players on that team start looking, looking for theirs. They want more, a bigger role. I think Marvel has a little bit of that going on in the sense that we are seeing them green light projects involving side characters, supporting ca characters where I don't think there's a future. And they need to be able, and they're also getting a lot of inbound from agents and A-list stars who want to be a part of the machine because they want that bad. And Marvel has to be able to say no to it, some of yeah. that. That I think is becoming at least part of the concern. We talked about the Clea scene in Doc Strange too. Again, it's no knock on Charlize Theron. She's amazing. But like that scene didn't really do it for us. It didn't really go anywhere. But really it's, what that scene was, was- It, it was, oh snap, Charlize Theron. 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 Exactly. That's exactly. exactly. That's right. Exactly. I don't want to see Mel Gibson. I don't want to see Denzel Washington. <laughs> well, that would be okay. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, that's a lot different than Tony Stark goes up to a bar with Thunderbolt Ross and says, we're putting the team together. That's a very different kind of scene. It's not about the celebrity star power in the scene. It's about the story you're trying to advance. So that's what I mean. And we see rumors like, okay, like I said, Catherine Hahn was great in WandaVision. All due respect to Catherine Hahn, she should not have her own show. We don't need an Agatha show. Haley Atwell looked great as Captain Carter. We don't need a Captain Carter movie. I'm sorry. There's reports that might... That's what I mean. Marvel has to be careful because the audience isn't just going to show up for any Marvel character, even if the actor or actress playing that character is pretty darn good. Yeah. They have to be able to say no when no is the right and when no is the right answer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Marvel does a good job of listening to the fans, but they don't have to do everything they ask for. You know? Because um, if you it's listen understanding to the roles, right? It's like, great. It's like Agatha Harkness works great as a supporting character in something else. It's not a character I view as a mainline lead character. Like if you want to carry the eight three, if you want to carry some version of, you know, Peggy Carter as Captain Carter and she she's part of a, you know, a multiversal team that has a support, fine, you can do that. But we don't need to remake First Avenger. Like who's honest, asking if you for wanted this? that they did that with what if they did that with what if yeah, like, who, so you like who's asking that. for this stuff who's asking for this who's saying yo we should do this is this somebody from inside that's saying we should do this or is it the fans asking for this i don't hear fans talking about this when i saw that 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 um that headline of a possible uh captain carter film being discussed I'm like, who the hell is asking for this? They need to chill. And I think that retreat is to chill. Brian. Um, again, we're not saying that MCU is going away anytime soon, but things happen pretty quickly. The the you know, one minute you're, 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 you're great. And then all it takes is a couple of string of movies for everybody to be like, you know, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't with it no more. And that is the problem, Brian. That's what I'm afraid of, that you're going to get subpar films coming out with everybody say, oh, these movies are great. No, they're not, yo. No, they're not. You were going to say something? I mean, the other... I was just going to say, we talked, we mentioned it in passing, but the other thing 
that I think actually should give you some hope and some confidence is what's going on over at Warner Brothers in DC. Because there's signs that David Zasloff is editing, editing the menu over there. We heard talk there was going to be a Wonder Twins movie. There ain't going to be no Wonder Twins movie. <laughs> his quote, but his quote is telling. Too niche. Bingo. So a guy who's not really steeped in comics lore walks in and within five minutes is like, what? No, nah, we're not doing that. I'm not saying he's going to be the panacea for DC filmmaking. What I am saying is the standard over there is being raised for what is going to make it to the big screen, what's going to make it onto HBO Max. It is no longer the throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. That is going to put some pressure on Kevin Feige and Marvel to do better. And ultimately, yeah. that could be the engine for getting things back on track is if DC actually does step forward and say, hey, we got the Matt Reeves that verse that's in pretty good shape. David Zaslav has clearly identified Superman as something he is going to stop at nothing to prioritize and reinvigorate. I mean, listen, if Superman is all of a sudden done right, I mean, that's going to be a major player in the in, in the genre mm -hmm. to deal with. So all of a sudden, like that could bring Marvel back to the center and back to their best. So, you know, that's why I say all is not lost for sure. No, 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 of course, but of course. For the first time, we can legitimately ask the question because there have been enough missteps and enough things that disappointed us to say, Marvel, you know, at least needs to be on guard that this isn't a slippery slope. Yeah. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of the possibility of this being the beginning of the end of the MCU or whether or not the power shift is occurring. Is DC coming up hot on their trails, you know? And if that happens, the DC fandom is not going to be quiet. If oh, we DC... still love it, man. Oh, we yeah, yeah. It. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Um, that'll, that'll reinvigorate, I guess, the genre, if that were to happen. Because now it's yeah. like, uh-oh, you know, Marvel was up here. And now that now DC is taking over with a string of hits, that's that'll be the day, Brian. That'll be the that'll be the day. But let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of this possibility. Um, hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Share with your friends. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.